Today with Joseph Prince. The cross is the place where everything, all the attributes of God met. God is love, you see it at the cross. God is just, you see at the cross. The Bible defines God as love, but God is just. So at the cross, you see His love. You see His justice, because His justice, you see Jesus being punished, the Son that He loved being punished. But Jesus did no sin, in Him is no sin. He, he, he knew no sin, but why was He punished? Because He was carrying our sins. Let's go back to this. All right, so this furniture place we started last week, when God says, God set forth Jesus to be a propitiation, very big word, but it actually means a mercy seat. Because the Greek version, the Septuagint, in the Old Testament, whenever it mentions the Ark of the Covenant, it calls the mercy seat, all right? In the Greek, hilasterion. The same word used, mercy seat, in Romans 3. God set Jesus to be a hilasterion. Jesus is the mercy seat. He is the Ark of the Covenant. And we learned that the Ark is made of a box of wood, acacia wood. Do you know that acacia wood, like cedar wood, uh, is impervious to uh, termites. Termites cannot bore a hole into it, no? It is, it, is, uh, it is immune to all kinds of diseases that will attack trees, other trees. Therefore, the illustration of acacia wood is used for incorruptibility. And wood in the Bible is always mankind. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Mankind. So Jesus was like a tender plant, growing in a moral morass, a place where everything was muddy and, 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 and it was dirty and unclean. And this beautiful tender plant grew up to be a tree. But in the prime of his life, he was cut off. He was cut off to prepare a mercy seat, Ark of the Covenant. And it was carved into shape, into a, a, a box, a case of wood. The wood speaks of Jesus' humanity. Amen. God, as God, cannot be comprehended by man. But if God can become a man, we can understand Him. Amen. Let's say I, 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 I take a walk one day and, and uh, I step on an ant that died, squashed. With all apologies to ant men. And they, they were on a date, their first date, and I just squashed her boyfriend. All right. And I'm telling the girlfriend, hey, hey, I, I, I didn't mean it. I, I, I really didn't mean it. I didn't see your boyfriend. I mean, and she, she won't understand. She'll be running away from me because we are different levels. You understand? Your love. I'm trying to illustrate. We are different levels of life. You understand? I'm too high a life for, for that end to understand. But if I can become an end. So Jesus became a man. Why? So that this wooden box, all right, will be overlaid with gold. Overlaid with gold. Gold within and gold without. Not only the gold is outside, the goal is inside, the inner side. Go outside, go inside. Go without, go within. In between, the wood. That means Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Because he's 100% man, he sat where you sat. You feel tired, he feels tired. Amen? You feel thirsty, you feel hungry, he felt it. All the, the gamut of human emotions, Jesus felt it without sin. Amen? But we, we feel something, but we don't have the power. But because it's 100% God, it's, He has all the power. Amen? Praise God. And He lived among us. I said He lived among us. He lived, he, he, I mean, He could have chosen the, the, the Jerusalem uh, uh, Royal Hilton or, you know, the, the best places to be born in. But He chose, when He took off, you know, His uh, outward form of uh, of. Uh, of regalia as, as the king of the universe. He came down and he was born in a manger, a smelly, dirty manger. He chose to be born in a poor family. And, and for those of you who's, who argue about, about Joseph and Mary being wealthy and all that, let me tell you this. When Jesus was born, all right, prior to Jesus' birth, prior to the coming of the wise men, all right, uh, Joseph and Mary were poor. Why? Because they brought the offering for a new baby. They brought two they bought, brought a pair of doves, and only the poor bring doves. The, the wealthy bring a bullock to be offered. The middle income bring a lamb. The poor bring a pair of doves. The very poor bring a handful of flour. So God will always take what man can to reflect anything on his son. Even the handful of flour is Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. As the bullock is strong to labor. So today, whether you're wealthy spiritually, is 
whether you have a large comprehension of Jesus, like a block-sized revelation of Jesus, or you only have an idea about his earthly life, no concept of what his death has accomplished. And that's a fine, just a fine flaw. So friend, Joseph and Mary did not stay poor because Jesus was there, all right? Uh, the, the wise men came and they brought gold, frankincense, all the very expensive items because of the baby, and they became wealthy. And by the way, the wise men did not come the, the day that Christ was born. They came when he was about two years old. Uh, I'm sorry I spoiled your, your nativity scene, but that's in the Bible, okay? If you felt a connection with our program today and you're thinking, yes, tell me more, then we want to give you Joseph's foundational book, Destined to Reign, for free. We want to help you take this journey of discovering the transformative power of grace and experience true victory over life's challenges, lack, and destructive habits today. Request your free copy of Destined to Reign by visiting josephprince.org slash new or texting new to 71239 today. Offer available to U.S. residents only. All right, so God said the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone, put it inside the box. Okay, let's look at a, a cross-section of uh, what's inside. Now, if you look inside the Ark of the Covenant, you see three items. Number one, you see the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments written the finger of God. is inside the Ark. Do you know the Ark, the first mention actually of the Ark is not in Exodus. It's actually in Genesis. The Bible says when Joseph died, they buried him in, uh, they, they, they put him in a coffin. The word coffin is the word ark. Ark, exactly the same word ark. So it's a coffin for the two tablets. God is saying, if you bring the ark out, everyone, everyone will die because the ark's perfect holiness will bring judgment on everyone who comes short of it. And folks, we come short of it. So the only place to put the the uh, two tablets of stone is under the mercy seat where once a year in Israel, in ancient time, blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat. It's called, in Hebrew, the mercy seat is called, in Greek, hilasterion, in Hebrew, kipporet. That's why you have Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, kippur, covering. Watch this, blood on the mercy seat. All it takes, people, is just one drop of blood. And when blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat, this is where Psalms 91 is referring to. The secret place under the wings of the Almighty, the El Shaddai. Amen. We dwell here. Praise the Lord. Jesus is our mercy seat. Can I have a good amen? Hallelujah. Amen. And when there's one thing, God's eyes can look into a man's heart. God's eyes can see your thoughts. God's eyes can see through walls. God's eyes can see through layers and layers and layers of mountains or even the valleys below and, and, the, and the seas below. God's eyes, nothing is hidden. Everything is naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. But there's one thing God's eyes cannot look through and that's blood. When there's blood, God cannot see the three items of man's rebellion. You know, the Ten Commandments, man rejected God's standard. Man comes short of God's standard. But the blood is over the tablets of stone. Are you listening? That's why the Bible says in Galatians 5, uh, 5 that if you try to keep the law, if you try to keep the law, you fall from grace. Whosoever is justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. That tells you grace is high ground. Grace is higher than the law. Mercy rejoices against overjudgment. Amen. Amen. And that's why when the people of Bashemesh, they try to look into the ark, they lift it up. Even Indiana Jones teach you that. <laughs> Raiders of the lost ark, right? They try to look inside. Death came in. Why? God is saying, I want the ark to cover, I want the mercy seat, the blood of Jesus to cover all of man's rebellion. Don't let me see man's rebellion. Amen. So the two tablets is man's rebellion of God's standard. The, the Aaron's rod that bothered, you see the white almond uh, flowers, that's Aaron's rod that bothered because all of them were, 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 were jealous that Aaron, they say, oh, it's COI, conflict of interest. Uh, Aaron is Moses' brother. That's why he made him the high priest. Amen. So God said to Moses, tell them all the 12 tribes, each one bring, the leaders of each tribe bring their rod. So all the 12 rods plus Aaron's rod was collectively put before the ark. Amen. Overnight. 
The next day they came to collect and all their rods, you know when you cut off the tree, right? There's no more life. But all of them took back their rods the same. But Aaron, when he picked up his rod, also cut off, right? That's how you get a rod. But Aaron's rod had blossomed. Budded, blossomed with white almond, uh, almond trees, white in color, blossoms, and then almond fruit. It's a picture of resurrection, life from the dead. Amen? So it speaks of, how did it come about? This occasion, man's rejection of God's leadership. God has put it under the mercy seat, under the blood. And then we have the golden pot of manna. What was the occasion for the manna from heaven? Amen? Where do you find that, that story? Manna, you find the manna. <laughs> Where do you find the manna? Amen? In Exodus, after they came out of Egypt, they crossed through the Red Sea. Amen? And then the Bible tells us we, that they were hungry and they complained. They told Moses, did you bring us out here to die, Moses? Is there any food here? And then God says, Moses, I will rain, not judgment. God could have said that. I will rain bread from heaven. And then Jesus came, one, 1,500 years after that. Jesus came and said to the Jews, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the desert and they are dead. This is a true bread which comes down out of heaven that if a man eat thereof, he will not die. And I am the living bread which cometh down out of heaven that if a man eat of me, he shall live forever. And listen, and the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Every time you take communion, remember that. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Remember when God told Adam and Eve, dying, in the process of dying, that's why aging is nothing more than dying. Dying, you shall die one day. The moment man starts, God never meant for man to die. So that dying is now reversed because the bread that I will give it's my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Remember that when you take communion. You're taking his life. I say you're taking his life. And then the Jews strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They don't understand. But thank God we do. All right? So praise God. Now, the cherubim, these two cherubim, notice their eyes. They are guardians. When you go to, uh, to heaven one day, amen, I mean, now you can go to heaven. I hate the idea of going to he heaven one day because you can go to heaven anytime, the throne of grace. This is the throne of grace. There's blood there now. And that blood is not the blood of bulls and goats. It's the blood of Jesus on the real mercy seat. The, the blood of Jesus is there in heaven. That speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Amen. Amen? All these are visual aids, you understand? All these are like visual illustrations, kindergarten stage for Israel to learn the A, B, C. So then Jesus comes. He is the true lamb. When John the Baptist saw him, he says, look! Look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And all the while, this, this uh, atonement, this uh, mercy seat, uh, cover the blood of bulls and the blood of goats and the blood of lambs only covers sin from year to year. It covers, it covers, but the sin is still there. It's like you sweep under the carpet, the problem is still there, but it's covered, it's covered, it's covered. Because there's no way blood of bulls and goats can take away sins until Jesus came. Then John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away sin of the world. Amen? Amen, church? So these this two uh, cherubim in heaven, you will see them. They are the guardians of, they are not God. They are the guardians of God's righteousness and holiness. They are first mentioned in the law of first mention. All right, we learned that they are guardians of God's righteousness. When God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, they stood at the entrance with a flaming sword. They will not allow anyone to come in. They are guardians of God's righteousness. So their eyes represent God's eyes. It's like God's eyes. But every time they look down, they see man's rebellion. The three tokens of man's rebellion. But once in a year, the blood is there. You know what they see? The blood speaking blessings upon the people. Amen. And now people, the blood of Jesus is permanently in heaven. So when God looks at you, God does not look at you with judgment. God looks at you with mercy and love. Amen. 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 In 1 Peter 1.12, it says that our salvation, our gospel, 
Even angels desire to look into it. One twelve. Look at the last part. Things which angels desire to look into. You know, angels are very inquisitive. They are, they are listening to my sermon right now. Because angels never know the joy that's mine. For the blood has never washed their sins away. Though they sing in heaven, there will come a time when silently they listen to us sing Amazing Grace. It's a song holy angels cannot sing. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. It's a song holy angels cannot sing. I once was lost. But now I'm found. Hallelujah. Amen. So angels are desiring to look into it. Amen. The things that we are talking about right now, they're desiring to look into all the beauties and glories of, of salvation. Why would the Son of God come down to die for men? Because the Son of God did not come to die for fallen angels. When Lucifer fell and became Satan, the Son of God did not come and die for fallen angels, but the Son of God came and died for men that is lower than angels. So angels are desiring to look into the salvation. And folks, everything about the cross, just understand this is a visual aid, you okay? When, when, when I travel, I bring my wife's photo. Of course, now it's in my, in my smartphone. And I look at my wife's photo to remind myself how beautiful she looks, right? But when I come back and I'm, I'm, I'm having coffee with her, I'm still looking at her photo, something is wrong. All right? She will say, baby, give me the phone. Right? Amen? And you better not say to your wife, this one looks younger. <laughs> then you will need my book on divine protection. <laughs> Amen? But what it is, is, is <laughs> it is a visual aid. It helps you to understand. Like in kindergarten, the ABCs, you know, uh, Apple is help you understand A is for Apple. You know that kind of thing? So these are visual aids. Don't get distracted with the visual aids. Don't miss out on the visual aids. I used to be, people asking, where do you think the Ark of the Covenant is, brother? Well, brother and sister, I have studied on this and I'm telling you, it's a waste of time because some say it's over here, some say it's over there, some say it's uh, uh, in the Temple Mount underneath, okay, which I happen to believe it is. Anyway, but the thing is that some say it's in Ethiopia. Doesn't really matter. The real Ark of the Covenant came. His name is Jesus. One time I asked the Lord, oh, by the way, this might come as a surprise to some people. Uh, even the uh, Bible scholars, they don't consider this, that when Jesus was here in Jerusalem, the temple that stood at that time, the temple of Herod, did not have the Ark of the Covenant. Do you know that? In the Holy of Holies, it's empty. Because many years before, Solomon, a, a man blessed by God with wisdom beyond that of any man except Jesus. Solomon knew that there will come a time the Babylonians will come in and take away all the furniture of the temple. Plus, if he, don't hide it, the ark. So Solomon hit the ark. That's why some believe that he hit in, in Ethiopia because it so happens that uh, Solomon has uh, many girlfriends, okay? One of them was an Ethiopian girl that came in, Queen of Sheba. Sheba, Sheba, Andre, Andre. Now she came and visited him, all right? She knocked on the door, she said, Andre, Andre, Andre. And, I, and then uh, supposedly she went back pregnant and then uh, that's an Ethiopian uh, uh, story over there, okay? So some say it's over there. That's the reason they say it's over there. But listen, by the time Jesus was here, the temple that stood did not have the ark. So one time, I was, I was one of those that was very keen to find out where's the ark. I, I would read books on it, buy you know, books on it, watch Nat Geo docu on this kind of things and all that. But it's a waste of time, I'll just tell you that, because the real ark has come. I asked, how I knew this was this. I asked the Lord one time, I asked the Father, Father in heaven, isn't it sad when Jesus was here? The temple did not have the ark. And the Father answered me and said, because he was walking outside opening the eyes of the blind, unstopping deaf ears, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers. Hallelujah! Who needs a, 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 a visual aid when the substance has come? Hey, trust me, kissing a photo is not as good as kissing the real girl. <laughs> Amen. I know, I just kissed my wife just now. So, it's a visual aid to help us understand, okay? Now sit back and watch this visual aid as the ark opens up. 
If you open up the panels on the right, the sides, go within, go without. This is what you see. The cross. So it is the person and the work of Jesus. Everything the Father has in mind is all about Jesus and the finished work. It's all about Jesus and the finished work. And do you know that whether Israel knew this or not, they could not understand why the cross. Because the cross was not uh, an invention during Moses' time. The cross is a very cruel form of execution that the Phoenicians and later on the Romans got it from the Phoenicians. And it's quite a modern day compared to Moses' time, okay? And that's why when David prophesied before the cross, the execution of the cross was implemented, David prophesied in David's time, 3,000 years ago. David says, they pierce my hands and my, my feet. So pierce my hands and my feet is crucifixion. It was a messianic psalm. That Jesus, because the, the capital punishment at the time was stoning. But this was crucifixion. So God was prophesying His Son. And let me tell you this, the cross is the place where everything, all the attributes of God met. God is love, you see it at the cross. God is just, you see it at the cross. God is light, amen. God, God has inflexible righteousness, amen. Holiness, unbending holiness, amen. And that's why when you sin, you're in trouble, amen. But on the other hand, God is love. So how do you see all these attributes at one time? God's love, God's righteousness at the cross. Because at the cross, even though God is just and He will punish sin, hey, you want a judge that is just. You don't want a judge that sort of like, like because of money given to Him, He's sort of like a, 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 a pet, pen, pender to people who are wealthy and then uh, he, he, he sort of like, He's strong on people who are poor. In some countries, you may have that. Let me tell you this, you want a judge who is just. We want a just judge. But we also want a judge whose essence, whose person, his being is love. God is love. The Bible defines God as love. But God is just. So at the cross, you see his love. You see his justice. Because his justice, you see Jesus being punished. The son that he loved being punished. But Jesus did no sin. In him is no sin. He, he knew no sin. But why was he punished? Because he was carrying our sins. So you see God's judgment. God did not say, oh, he's my son. Okay, boys will be boys. Never mind. I sweep everything under the carpet. No. Because he was carrying our sins, your sins and my sins, he was punished. He was judged. He was cursed that you might be blessed. Amen. He was rejected that you might be accepted. Amen. Amen. He wore a crown of thorns so that you and I today can have the peace of God guarding our hearts and minds. Amen, people. So at the cross, you see God's love. You see God's love. Why? It's not you. Bearing the judgment. It's not you, your children, suffering at the cross. God provided His Son to be the Lamb that takes away your sin and also the one that takes your punishment. So you see God's love blending with God's justice, righteousness and mercy met, mercy and truth kissed at the cross. At the cross, you see all the attributes of God magnified, glorified, all the claims of divine holiness fully met. The law of God magnified. The Ten Commandments honored. And Christ fulfilled the law. We're not under the law because we break the law. We're not under the law because Christ fulfilled the law. That's why we're under grace. At this point, we go home with Leonard. Amen? Are you blessed? And the way they came, look at the camp, uh, encampment of the 12 tribes of Israel. In the camp, God says, three tribes to the north, three tribes to the west, three tribes to the east, and, uh, and, the, and the south part, this, sorry, this is the east part. The east part has the largest number of people in the tribe of Judah, so it's longest. So look, look from the helicopter point of view, I, I do not think that the tribes knew how they were camped. But if you look from a helicopter point of view or a mountain point of view, you see the cross. No wonder that prophet Balaam when he was hired to curse Israel from the mountaintop, he looked at it and says, how can I bless those whom God, how can I curse those whom God has blessed? When God looks at Israel, he has not beheld iniquity in Israel. He did not say there's no iniquity, no sin in Israel. He says God did not behold it. Okay? Our comfort is not that there's no sin in us. 
our comfort is God does not see our sin. Why? Because God sees the blood. God sees the blood of His Son. Hallelujah! Blessed by what you've seen today? Subscribe to the Joseph Prince Ministries YouTube channel and never miss a single episode. New videos released daily that will encourage and empower you to live a victorious life. 